how Raging Kitty, whose real name is Keith Gill, was sued twice in June and July of 2024, allegedly in an effort to stop him from communicating and to stop the biggest short squeeze ever. There's a lot more to this story, so stay tuned and let's get some money. Now let's get to the important information Martin filed this lawsuit in U.S. federal court against Keith Patrick Gill. It was obvious that the intention was to stop Roar and Kitty from tweeting in order to avoid the run-up from May, June, and July, which would have been the biggest short squeeze in history. This complaint accuses Roar and Kitty of pumping and dumping or manipulating the market, and it wants that they repay all of the money he made from the recent GameStop runs. In essence, this case suggests that Plaintiff Keith Gill understood exactly what he was doing when he bought call options before he returned to Twitter, and it also suggests that because of his enormous social media following, he might now control the market. That being said, I fail to see how what Roar and Kitty tweeted about GameStop is any different from anything that Jim Cramer or any other hedge fund manager says in the public media regarding a stock. But obviously, this is just their latest ploy to make him feel fearful. Although Roar and Kitty doesn't necessarily need a 9-to-5 job anymore, this lawsuit actually reveals that he was once a registered stockbroker. It seems very unfair that they took away his job and his ability to be a registered stockbroker simply for tweeting about a company. Although I won't go through the entire lawsuit, this is something really interesting to learn about. I'll leave the link down in the description below but obviously identifies that on 12th of May 2024 Roar and Kitty came back to Twitter and effectively caused a massive jump in the GameStop stock price but arguably what's most interesting about this lawsuit is the guy that actually raised the Lawsuit his name is Martin Rev, who as P.K. Lance has identified is actually an employee or an owner of Corner Store Fund Services, a.k.a. he works at a hedge fund or even owns a hedge fund, likely a hedge fund that is short GameStop potentially with synthetic shares again, that was likely to be liquidated. Unless Roar and Kitty was sued, I think they raised this lawsuit against him to stop him from tweeting and to stop him from bringing more attention towards GameStop. And I am S. He can and was causing massive movements in the stock's price, which was potentially on the brink of causing the mother of all short squeezes. But what I do find hilarious is that as of today, or as of last night, the internet link mo.com now redirects to the Roaring Kitty YouTube channel. I'm not sure if September 4th has anything to do with 741 or anything else because I'm not that familiar with GameStop's intricacies. But I do think it's intriguing that as of yesterday, both of these URLs now redirect straight to his YouTube channel. I'm not sure if Roaring Kitty bought the link and changed the destination to his YouTube account. Interestingly, the September4th.com link also takes users to his YouTube page. I also wanted to talk about Moomoo's most recent, incredible offer, which gives customers 20 free stocks at sign up and an incredible 8.1% interest return on funds that are currently uninvested. After you sign up and make a $100 deposit, you will receive 8 free shares. You will earn 12 more free shares for a total of 20 free shares if you invest $1,000. Moomoo has finally made cash accounts available so you can no longer lend money for stocks. Instead of being limited to a margin account, Moomoo allows you to stop lending money for any stocks and switch to a cash account. Furthermore, 8.1% interest is paid to you on funds that are not invested. This consists of a base interest rate of 5.1% plus an extra 3% interest charge for a duration of three months. As I've already mentioned, Moomoo is the only broker that doesn't take payments for order flow, so be sure to join by hitting my link in the explanation below. What's also interesting is that the SEC is also suing Virtue Financial for stock market manipulation and front-running retail trades and their own customers' trades now Virtue motion to dismiss the case in court, but the judge replied saying the defendants allowed nearly unrestricted access to material non-public information and misled customers, and therefore denied the motion to dismiss, so it looks like this lawsuit or this case against Virtue will actually be heading to court where all of the truth will be unveiled, it'll be very interesting to see exactly how Virtue was manipulating the market and how they were front-running customers. But I imagine, as usual, they'll just receive a small fine, but the truth will be out there. It also seems this lawsuit will garner a lot of press or public attention, especially on Twitter, as it will be covered by a number of journalists. For example, this account here with 273. 000 followers is already tweeting about the SEC versus Virtue lawsuit. Now the reason why this lawsuit progressing is good or is very interesting is because everything discovered in this SEC case against Virtue Securities can and likely will be used in the ongoing Department of Justice RICO lawsuit. It appears as these dominoes are steadily being knocked down first with Andrew Left in Sight and Research, then with Doug Sue and Virtue until finally we get to Ken Griffin in Citadel and it seems Doug Sue is desperate to try and stop any short squeezes he possibly can by fighting back against the SESEC. 
Doug tweeted that the SEC had been notified in order to stop exchanges from listing risky, tiny stocks. Furthermore, he told Gary Gendler, this is how you can truly add value. Basically, Doug C. wants the SEC or wants these exchanges to delist penny stocks and ban them from listing them, but I think it's likely. Because many of these penny stocks are where all of the synthetic shorts are held, don't forget a synthetic shorter's main aim is to get a stock below a do or $2 per share to desperately try and get that stock delisted. They don't want that stock to ever be relisted, and they don't want, want those stocks on the stock exchanges because if the stock is delisted and is seller boxed for an eternity, they never have to close that short position, but all the while the stock remains listed and all the while more and more retail investors are trading these small stocks causing miniature short squeezes. Or even larger short squeezes, it puts these hedge funds at risk, but obviously if Doug Sue can get these small stocks delisted and stop them from ever being listed again, he effectively wins, and that's why I think that any stock, whether it's large, small, or mid-sized, should be listed on the stock. Exchange in addition. I wanted to briefly list a few of the successes that has already experienced. Snowbird earned over $7,000 from its NASDAQ calls. GovXGX saw a 21% increase, while Sing Sing saw a 51% gain. This tweet about AMC and the huge price target that real Wall Street analysts set for company years ago is intriguing to read. It states that Wall Street analysts had set a price target of $400 per share when AMC acquired Karmic in 2017, despite the fact the company owed an astounding $5 billion at the time. After seven years, we have less debt, more income, less expenses, and less profit, therefore I'm wondering what AMC's real price objective should be. This image shows the number of screens at AMC in 2013 and 2022. In 2013, AMC claimed to have more than 6,000 screens by 2022. That number had nearly doubled to nearly 8,000. Put differently, AMC wanted to sell its shares for $400 a piece and own 6,000 screens. To what extent AMC's $8,000 screens, higher profits, lower costs, and larger revenue should boost the real price objective is a question I have. Considering that AMC won't be carrying any debt going forward, Biotech Moose thinks it ought to be at least $350 to $400 a share. Probably the main reason these specialist costs have altered the target was whittled down to $400 per share due to pressure from synthetic shorting and other hedge funds. In conclusion, Kristen tweeted about a hedge fund that was recently fined $250,000 for allowing 10 million short sales without locating shares, which is further evidence that synthetic shorting exists and was hidden for at least six or seven years. I imagine that these shorts or these hedge funds are attempting to unload their synthetic short position and gather as many shares of AMC from the paper hands as they can before driving the price back up. There is so much to unpack from that sentence. It demonstrates that synthetic shorting does exist and may exist in much larger quantities than people realize because it is only discovered in small amounts. Remind Charles